get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise he just simply outruns him and wants the ball. He wants to catch the football, and he does. Takes it in for the touchdown. A little magic on the part of Mike Thomas. Second to go before halftime. Short drop fade pattern. Wendell Davis. What a grab. Oh, dandy. Wendell Davis, number one back in 88. Maybe this is the reason why. Tight coverage, a total sellout by Davis. Beautiful grab, six points, Chicago. Sensational grab by Davis, the right corner of the end zone. Rifled his first pro TD to Wendell Davis. From Tom Zach, from there, Tom Zach to Wendell Davis. Makes the catch despite the pass interference. The Bears lead 14-7 at the half. They're still up 14-13. Jim Harbaugh, a 43-yard touchdown pass to Wendell Davis, who steals it. He simply steals it from Wayne Haddock. The Bears lead 21-13. Now Vinny would go down once again. He would have to leave the game. Harbaugh play action to Rouse back to throw. He heaves it deep down the left side, yeah. going for it. Wide receiver. Yeah. Wendell Davis, touchdown. The only offense today. Two minutes to go. Big play. Jim Harbaugh, watch the throw to Wendell Davis. He beats one of the best, Mark Collins. 75 yards, 10 nothing. Chicago. The fullback and Walker <laughs> setting up at the seven yard line on fourth down. They fake it to Walker and loft it into the end zone and a touchdown to Nova Selsky. Give me a break. You think Bob Schnauker, who called that play, is perhaps thinking he's moving on if it doesn't work? And it's popular in Pittsburgh. Brent Novoselsky. And when Wade Wilson put that ball in the air, guys, I didn't think Novoselsky was going to be able to get to it. Well, he has not had a whole lot of practice doing so. He usually is in there strictly to block. Here's the play action, a little bit of it to Herschel Walker. Look at this effort. That's wide receiver all the way. And that is an absolutely perfect throw by Wade Wilson. Novoselsky's second touchdown of the year. Here's Carlos for the extra point. And irony of ironies, Novoselsky started the season with Green Bay. Picked up on waivers by Minnesota and may have just put Green Bay out of the playoffs. Long time to go. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and... You know, I'm going to introduce formally our guests today, Brent Jamar and Wendell Davis in a second, but I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. Um, and since this is sort of the bridge, you know, sports and business and everything in between some past episodes, uh, I had Chris Gronkowski on, who is founder of Ice Shaker, who talks about his Shark Tank experience and receiving investment from Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez. So check that episode out. Also, Benny Fowler, who's currently with the 49ers. He caught Peyton Manning's last pass of his career in the Super Bowl and uh, talked about kind of doing executive coaching and what he's doing with that. And um, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. We do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Brent, you know me a little bit, Jamara, not yet as much, Wendell, not yet as much, but. The number one thing in my life is relationships, and I'm always looking at a ways to give to my best relationships. And one of the ways I found over the past decade is to profile them, their thought leadership, and the people and companies I admire on the podcast. So if you've thought of starting a podcast, I think everyone should personally, but if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and email us. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. And you know, I want to also give a shout out to Tracy DeForge, who's CEO and co-founder of the Players Impact, uh, which is a platform built to empower athletes in business and exclusively for current and former professional athletes looking to preserve and build wealth through investments. And some of their community members are Tracy McGrady, Gabby Douglas, Maurice Evans, and many more. I was talking to her the other week and I was like, I have an amazing group of 
professional athletes and business people coming on. So it made me think of her. And today's guest, uh, Brent Novoselsky, is in wealth management with GCG and has been serving clients since 1989 with a particular focus on accumulation and preservation of assets along with risk management. He played seven seasons in the NFL uh, with the Chicago Bears in 88, Minnesota Vikings from 89 to 94. Uh, he retired after a serious neck injury. He's also a member of the, I don't know, if, I wonder if Jamar and Wendell know this fact about you, Brent. We'll see. Um, he's a member of the Chicago Jewish Sports Hall of Fame and yep. active in many charities, uh, serves in the NFL Players Association, former player, uh, Chicago chapter. And um, he also has a scholarship program. So maybe we'll talk about that too. Um, and we have a Wendell Davis, former NFL wide receiver who played for the Chicago Bears for six seasons, selected by the Bears in the first round. You know, well, obviously I'm, I'm from Chicagoland, so I grew up watching you um, and was selected by the Bears in the first round in 88 and was two-time All-American at Louisiana State, uh, was assistant coach for the 49ers and is co-founder of TriWin Medical, uh, which is a Chicago-based healthcare products and services company, along with he's got a bunch of endeavors that he's working on. So we'll talk about those. And Jamar Williams, former player who saw action in the NFL and the CFL, was signed by the New, New England Patriots in 2006. I think you were part of that team that was like 13 and one, Jamara. And uh, 18 and one. Eight was it? Eight, yeah, that, amazing. 18 and one. I don't want to lose two games <laughs> off from you. So he's worked with RL Canning for almost a decade, which is a global provider of information technology consulting services. So thank you all for joining me. Appreciate it. Oh, good to be here. This is where I stopped talking and you guys talk the whole time. But um, I want to talk. We'll talk about some highs and lows career wise uh, sports and business. But I wanted to start off with transitioning, transitioning from professional sports to business and the different facets are involved. And Brent, I would love for you to start off and talk a little bit about transitioning from professional sports to business. Yeah, everybody thinks about transition. The one thing they don't really think about is when you're transitioning from the NFL to business, <clears throat> I mean, you, you're in a locker room, first of all. So it's that locker room mentality that you can no longer have going into a business, at least uh, back in the 90s when Wendell and I came out. I think, Jamara, it was probably a little more um, professional uh, when you got that. I mean, literally during my tenure with the Vikings was when they first allowed women to come into the locker room and interview you. So we all had little towel things that we had to put on and, and, you know, just the differences uh, that that made. But more importantly, when we transitioned out, um, except for maybe Barry Sanders and Megatron, every single one of us didn't really walk out of the game the way we wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us were carried. So um, with me, it was my neck. I had a neck injury. So it was a season ending injury with uh, Wendell. I think uh, we, you were done after Philly, weren't you? That was uh, yeah, pretty much. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, you could say that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you know, you blow out two knees in one play. It's not such a good thing. And then, Jamar, I'm not sure, were you injured or did you actually walk away? I walked away. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, when you walk away, you're not really walking away. They're kind of pushing you out. Right, right. <laughs> I'd love to get back in, but no, they don't want me. So you're leaving immediately in a different mindset. Plus, you know, you've got this network of folks around you, and all of a sudden you're not a player. And there's a whole bunch of those folks that just, they scram. I mean, they, you still got their numbers, but they never call you back. They, you know, they're on to the next athlete. So, yeah. you know, although we have the NFL in our background, I always talk to former players and say, look, use that as a springboard. People want to hear about that. Um, but the direct transition from the game to business is a lot more uh, difficult. It's, it's a lot trickier than people think. I mean, when I interview with GCG, I was, I had to get neck surgery. I literally got my neck surgery and I was on like, um, they, I had an issue where I had to have like uh, medicine going in me out of backpack with medicine. And I literally interviewed in a, in a track suit with, mm. you know, medicine going in and trying, I had staph infection, the whole big to do, but we're, you know, you're able to do that if you bring that, that personality in, but it's really so much different than what you're used to dealing with on the field, in the locker room, all of a sudden, you know, you've got to transition that. And if you can do it properly, that's fine. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a different animal. So be interesting to go. I, I, 
Go ahead, Wendell. Uh, you know, you were nodding when he said the, uh, you know, there's physical, emotional, and different peer group, and you were nodding when he was kind of saying there's this emotional piece when you leave in different peer group. What are your, what are your, what was your experience? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I agree with everything that uh, Brent said. I identify with it as well. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, you know, everybody um, leaves differently from the NFL. Um, like you said, some people leave on their own terms. Some people leave <laughs> uh, not on, on their own terms. And, and, and I, and, and, and and be honest, most people that leave not on their terms, uh, we, we struggle. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy because it's something that you, you are not ready to do. You are not prepared to do. Um, now, I, I, I will say that there are uh, people now that players now are athletes now, they it's, it's top of mind and they think about it more often than at least I can speak for myself than I did when I played. Uh, I think the, the younger athletes are a lot better prepared um, than I, I was. But, um, but that transition is, is different for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, it, it's different when you, you, you're, 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 you've played football all your life and you're going to uh, use your skills in another profession. Uh, you're not walking into a stadium. <laughs> to use those skills, you walk into a, a, a building and, you know, you got people looking at you like, okay, you, you're a football player. You know, what, what do you bring to the table? <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not throwing any balls in here. We're not, we're not catching any balls. You know, we're not running, you know, this is, this is different. So you, you have to really get over that hurdle. And I think it really first starts with, with the, with the player, with the athlete. Uh, starts in the mind and trying to get through that transition. You mentioned one of the mindset. What was, you know, that's different maybe from today's athletes than when you were, or for yourself, what was your mindset? Oh, I, 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 I everything was football to me. Um, <laughs> everything was playing football and you had in your mindset that football was going to take you, you know, two hours ready to stop, you know, 10 years, 12 years, I'm going to play. And then when you get in the league, you find out that uh, the average is less than three years. Uh, and then you, you find out that uh, every time you, you, you step on the field, you're taking a risk. We're not talking about just the games. We're talking about going to practice, you know. Uh, you know, and, you know you're used to in, in college or playing. You get hurt in college. You're going to hang around, you know. You'll come back the next year probably. But in the pros, <laughs> and you guys are laughing. Yeah. But in the pros, you don't want to hang around. And if you're hanging around in the in the in the training room in the in the tub, you out. You know, you're not gonna be there long. And now you're talking about somebody's profession, somebody's job. I got family. I got people depending on me. So it's it's a lot different. A whole mm. lot different. Yeah, and and just to kind of piggyback what what both Brent and Wendor are saying. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting about, you know, professional sports as a whole is uh, average, average time, like Wendell said, is generally two and a half, three years, right? But when a young player starts out, he's generally about 21 or 22. So if you become, you know, that, that outlier that makes six, seven, maybe even eight years, you're still extremely young. In corporate America, you start at 28 in a leadership role of some kind. I mean, this is a baby, you're a phenom. Right. And so when you get to that point where you are making that transition, your 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 mind, especially when you're on the field, you're still in this age of I'm young, I'm fast, I still have it. And then you built all of these relationships with so many players. And then all at the at the drop of a dime, it's like, OK, well, you're old, you don't have it. <laughs> this is washing away the relationships and the individuals that you've built have that have become family, brothers. You know, it's all stripped away from you and you're completely starting from scratch at that. So it's mm -hmm. a, it's a huge emotional toll. Um, it, it's a a new chapter that you're beginning. You're you start to learn yourself all over as 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 a man, as, as a football player, um, you know, as a human being. And so um, it, it's different stages that you go through 
as it relates to building yourself up and then, you know, recreating yourself at the same time. And, you know, as a player, you're, you're, the mindset is you're one way from, from superstardom, from being that yellow jacket hall of famer. Um, everybody on the next level, no matter what position you play, no matter what, you know, what position you are on the depth chart, they're all exceptional athletes. They were all, you know, all American, all state, you know, they were these high ranking individuals coming up that you watched as kids in high school and college. And then they're putting them all on the same playing field, you know? So it's a huge, huge, huge um, transition and in, in form of events that you go through um, socially, emotionally, and, and even physically. Mm. Jamal, what, what made you transition? Um, because as Brent asked, did you have like a, you know, the injury and you're like, no, I, I chose a transition. So talk about that yeah. for a second. Cool. So it, it for me, um, I guess I got to take a couple steps back. I was uh, born and raised um, Metroland Detroit area. Um, for me, I was always an undersized kid. Football was never really something that I imagined playing professionally. It was just, well, if I play football, I can get a free scholarship. I wanted to go to college <laughs> uh, and that was it. I wanted to be a doctor. So, well, Jamar, give people a sense. You say undersized. If someone's looking at you now, they'd be like, (laughs) okay, let's put this in perspective. You're undersized compared to an offensive lineman. So, (laughs) when you graduated high school, what, you know, talk about, you know, what was your size in high school? So, in high school, uh, I stepped foot freshman year um, to a predominantly brother Rice. I know there's one in in Chicago, Illinois, um, one here in, in Michigan. Um, I was four foot 11, 105 pounds, walked into to wow. school. And when I graduated, freshman year. Freshman year. And when I, wow. I wow. was five, six, 155, 165. <laughs> Wendell's like, <laughs> always, the ball was bigger than him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I had big feet at that. So it was these skinny legs, big feet, but they moved so fast. And so, <laughs> so when well, I graduated, you had a good coach. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> oh gosh. So when I graduated, um, and I, I had signed my letter of intent, Buffalo, going into Buffalo. Um, they signed this kid that was five six, 160 pounds. I show up to the first day of camp. I'm five five foot nine. <laughs> About a buck sixty five, buck seventy. They're like, oh my gosh, like where have you been? So, um, <laughs> Now, now I stand about five foot nine, two fifteen or so. Um, but my playing weight in in pro was was five foot nine, about one hundred ninety pounds. Um, but it was a journey. It was a lot of work that was put in it. And in college, for me, and getting back to the question, Doctor Rice, um, I, I went to school and I was majoring as an exercise science pre med major. So my minor was um, was biology and chemistry. I wanted to go and, and be a doctor. You know, I was planning on taking the MCAT in sophomore year, uh, college, have an outstanding season. And um, a few agents were, were calling, talking to my parents. And at this point, it dawned on me like, OK, it's probably a little easier to go to the NFL than it is. To think- <laughs> so I think I'm going to go this route. <laughs> um, and so that happened for me. And first year, um, I was fortunate enough to, to land with the New England Patriots. Um, I uh, I. I got interested in, in business as a whole franchise. And it goes back to what you int- opened up in the introduction, talking about relationships. And so, you know, I started to cultivate many relationships when I was in the NFL. Um, people was something that, you know, I, I saw I had a lot of people skills, gravitated to me naturally. I said, okay, I want to own my own franchise. Um, Cold Stone was huge um, back in about 2006 to 2008. You'd have individuals lining up around the corner just to get ice cream. Well, if you remember in 2008, the economy tanked. And so when you think about spending 20 bucks to provide your family with ice cream or $80 to fill up your gas tank, you know, many people were making that decision to go ahead and fill up the gas tank and take care of the family versus the luxury of something like ice cream. But at that point, I had already started the process of, you know, being approved, um, was in a position to go ahead and buy a store in Durham, North Carolina. Um, God told me to put that on hold. And so uh, at that point, the entrepreneur bug was bit, right? Mm. So second year, uh, we go to the Super Bowl, had a few injuries that season. Um, it, it was the infamous 18-1 uh, season where 
the 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 Patriots lost to to the Giants, the over the head catch. Mm-hmm. From there, uh, not a lot of doors open for me, and I am going to the CFL. And at this point, you know, you you're I'm in a different league. The passion isn't necessarily the same, but again, it's all about business. Is it is it is what's my next step? Now I'm preparing for that, right? You you made it to the NFL. You reached your high. Um, you know, you're you're looking at okay, is there a possibility? You're thinking about the shelf life. Um, you're thinking about all the different seminars you had as it relates to you know um, business and finances when you were in the NFL. Um, and so that 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 time came for me where it was like, okay, I I want to pursue my education on the next level. So I went and, and got started working on my MBA. Finished up with my MBA, and um, I remember I was in my second season, going into my third season. I was midway through my third season. And uh, we had a bye week over in Canada. And by this time, I had another ACL. I had an ACL tear. Um, so I came back from there a year and a half later. Um, and my girlfriend or wife at the wife now was girlfriend at the time was here in Chicago. And I, I remember coming home to the bye week. And uh, I said to her, I don't think I want to play anymore. She's like, well, what do you mean? Like, you know, you finish the season. Out? I'm like, I'm just not passionate. It's, it's, it's not. It's not driving me and motivating me the same way that it did. And I always said that when I don't love the game like I did when I was a kid, then at that point, I don't want to play anymore. So I remember calling, picking up the phone, talked to my agent, um, told him, you know, hey, John, you, you know, I'm, I'm not going back um, after the bye week. And he's like, all right, we'll just finish the season. He's talking to me about the season. Nah, now nah, I want to start my next chapter. So he called the team, let them know. Um, and at that point, I didn't even have when I when I walked away from it, I didn't even have a job. Um, so mm-hmm. it was that process of reinventing myself mm-hmm. all over. So it's like, OK, what do you want to do now? One of the misconceptions that people have about professional sports is everybody makes millions of dollars. And so when you're done, you can just take your millions of dollars, throw it into a business and be successful. <laughs> That's not always the case. Um, not everyone has millions of dollars. And even if you do. Um, for most entrepreneurs and business leaders, you know and understand if you don't have the skills and the resume to go behind it, great. We'll come, we'll support and see Brent and take a couple autographs. You know, we'll we'll come take some pictures with Wendell. We'll 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 have some fun with all of these players, but I'm not going to invest into someone that hasn't necessarily put in the 10,000 hours of practice that makes you successful. Those same skills that you did as a professional football player in terms of putting in those 10,000 hours that made you successful, you have to do it within that space. So that was the next step for me. I um, I remember coming to Chicago, started filling out tons and tons of applications. Um, one thing that I knew was, again, I, I want to be a successful entrepreneur, but um, I don't have that skill set. You know, when, when you're in college, you're playing sports. You don't necessarily do the same internships that a normal student has the opportunity to do. So um, I took entry level sales job. It was business to business sales. And it was literally one of the most humbling but learning experience I could have got. You went from signing autographs to begging for appointments and um, learning something that was completely foreign for you. Um, for me, it was mm. technology. And, um, you know, one of the things that I did was I, I used the same skills that that made me successful within sports. Um, I'm curious, Jamar, okay. this is a good question. You know, I love it that it's it's a big transition. It's humbling. And you, you, you know, you go from signing autographs to trying to get appointments. I love from each of you. What are some of the tactics you used? Now you're in the business world. What do you you have some, I don't know, street cred in being in professional sports, what what levers do you pull now to get in front to get appointments um, in the door that mo- you know some people don't have? So, Brent, I love it. I love it, Brent. You name a few, and then Wendell yeah, and sure. Jamal come back well, to you. You know, when you when you get out, everybody's like, oh, I don't want to deal with it. I want to watch football. I don't want to, mm-hmm. you know, I want to stand on my own two feet. I want to get in there because it's me. And then very soon, you realize. I got to use everything I need, you know, everything I've got at my disposal, all my different attributes. So I noticed the payroll companies used to use, or they probably still do these um, very attractive, young, female, most of them were blonde, and most of them were pretty well endowed. And I always said, 
if you could get out that, hey, you know, I played in the NFL. And for me, it was I went to Penn. I graduated from Wharton, played, you know, played for the Bears, had my number retired by the Bears. Long story. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I got somewhat of a brain. But as an NFL player, you can go see a business owner. You can go see a prospect usually based upon the fact that that prospect is a, um, a fan of the NFL or a fan of football. So I always said, hey, we are the blondes at the payroll company that can go in and talk to these folks. They want to talk to us. And, and the reality with sales is you're talking to them for 55 minutes about family, about football. That last five minutes is, okay, hey, let's talk about the deal. Uh, same thing with the golf course. So um, I think it's, it's absolutely embracing everything that made us what we were and not just saying, you know, we spent tens of thousands of hours working out, working out catching balls, running routes, doing all the things we need to do to be successful. All of a sudden you can't just scrap that. You need to use all that stuff that you had there. Use, you know, kind of the outskirts of it and, and then transition that and again, springboard into success in a different occupation. Yeah. Wendell, what about you? When, what did you do when you transitioned uh, from the NFL to full-time business world and how did you open doors? Um, for me, uh, it was more uh, what you talked about earlier about relationships. I think um, it was the relationships that I made um, uh, with um, my fellow teammates, but also relationships off the field. Uh, and I am not, I guess, in, play, in playing professional sports and playing football, you find out who you are. <laughs> pretty quickly <laughs> what you like and what you don't like right uh what works for you what what skill sets you have uh what you're good at and i found out that i am not a guy who could go out and sell that's 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 not me i found out that i am good at uh support roles you know i can i can support the team uh same way as a receiver you know being very supportive in the offense um that's kind of what I, I kind of like it myself uh, to Barnabas in the Bible, you know, very, very supportive of, um, of, of everybody and uh, encouraging people. Uh, so I found myself drifting toward uh, mentoring uh, uh, opportunities, uh, you know, getting into starting my own camp, you know, football camp, getting into coaching. Um, you know, I was said, you know, I, I, I'd like to, to mentor young people that could come in a lot of different forms. Uh, it could be a coach, it can be a teacher, it can be whatever, you know, but that's kind of how I found, you know, how I got in the door for, for a lot of the opportunities that I had. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And um, I want to go through and talk about maybe what, what was a high point, high moment career wise uh, and then low moment career-wise in, in football. Um, and Jamar, start us off. What was a, what was a, a high point and low point? Don't say the Super Bowl. Don't, <laughs> you say, the eight, Super don't, Bowl? don't say the 18-1 one season. <laughs> <laughs> we went 18-1. It and indeed one. was that. <laughs> that was high and low. <laughs> that's right <laughs> it, it was that week man. that 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 media day week man that's that's uh definitely a surreal moment it is that that moment when you're tossing the ball around as a kid whether you're playing with yourself or playing by your, with, with your friends that you're it's this play i'm in the super bowl and you know it, you, you set that stage for yourself and so that was definitely you know being there being in that atmosphere um, being around that and and being able to to take pictures with some of the the legends, you know, um, Jerry Rice, Ronnie Lott, Dion, you know, meeting those guys and having them interview you for for that big moment, um, that was huge. That was hmm. probably the, what about the, low low point? Low um, first training camp, partial tear to hamstring. Mm -hmm. um, I am um, you know doing. I was having a great camp, um, rookie year. Um, playing multiple positions, starting off and doing four reps at corner with, with one group. Then I'd go to the, the, the safety position, then go to nickel. And, 
you know, at this point, I'm just thinking, oh, man, I, I can't wait for the season. And uh, you had that, that partial tear, and I would never missed a game in college. So for me, um, to be sidelined for, for many months, that was tough. Very tough. Mm. Brent, what about you? Mine's easy. High point. Uh, yeah, high point. Uh, my first year with the Vikings, I just gotten cut from the Packers. Played on Monday night, the last game of the year when they used to play the games on Monday night. And we played Cle- uh, Cincinnati, excuse me, and they were very good. They had just gone to the Super Bowl the past year. And four minutes left to go in the game, fourth down and two on our own two-yard line. We had Herschel Walker, Anthony Carter, Steve Jordan, and they threw the ball to me <laughs> and uh, caught the ball in the corner of the end zone, got my feet down, scored a touchdown, no two-point play at the time. So we were leading by nine, and Boomer Esiason and couldn't, couldn't take them back. So we, we wound up winning, going to the playoffs. And, uh, yeah, that by far was, was the greatest moment, and, and I still play it on a loop. Uh, but then the, the hardest was November 27th, 1994, uh, against Tampa Bay. I was running down on second quarter on a kickoff and made a great tackle and knee hit my shoulder and mop, popped my uh, disc out. C three, four, and I uh, didn't make it past halftime was in clothing going to get, um, uh, x-rayed and the doctor asked me how many, uh, car accidents I'd been in. And he said, you're not going back. And that was it. That was all of a sudden realizing there's more to life than football, which that was the shocking part because we were driving around during the game. And I'm like, why are people out walking? Around? Shouldn't they be watching the game? And it just didn't <laughs> dawn on me that actually not everybody in the world watch football. No. Yeah. I remember wow. watching, um, and when all of, all of you go, but I remember watching Brent, I don't know. There's a clip out on YouTube or something that's like nine or 11 minutes of just highlight reel of you <laughs> tackling people from kickoff. I don't know if it, Wendell or Jamar, you ever, he's got this patented fist pump. Like <laughs> no matter what, it's just, tiger. It, was it could, tiger. it was, yeah. it's, it's so uh, <laughs> inspiring. The, uh, the vigor that you played with um, Wendell, what about you? What was low point and um, high point? Um, there's a lot of high points. Um, playing uh, mine go all, go all the way back to um playing in <laughs> playing uh youth football uh, playing youth football playing high school ball playing i mean i got so many um but the one that really uh stands out to me over my uh football career is uh the day i got drafted um to the bears uh and it was uh, it stands out because it was a day that, um, you know, it was just a lot of pressure, a lot of um, waiting all day. I ended up being the last pick in the first round. Uh, but what made it so special was the, the time I spent with my mother, uh, the way we celebrated um, by ourselves. We had a house full of people, um, but uh, we went out and went to one of the bedrooms and we celebrated together, uh, which was really made that special for me. Um, and as far as the low point, uh, really quickly, know, Wendell, yeah. growing up, did you always want to be a football player? Um, yeah, I, I, I love playing. I, I started out playing baseball. That was the first hmm. uh, sport that I organized sport that I played. Um, and I got pretty good at baseball. Um, but uh, then it got introduced to football. Uh, used to play football in the neighborhood, but not in an you know, not with a youth league. And then, you know, the talent just came out in, in football. Uh, then after that, I thought I'd pursue football. But I, mm. I played baseball and got drafted by the Giants mm. uh, out of high school, but decided, you know, hey, I, I'm going to play football. I think my skill set is better for football. Um, but yeah. Um, and after that, I just always wanted to play, play football. Before you get to the low point, what was it like, you know, you mentioned your mom, what was her emotion and reaction at when you got drafted? Oh, she, I mean, it was, it's hard to describe. She was very emotional. I mean, there was crying, um, you know, the whole thing, you know, my, my dad was in the other room. Um, uh, but for some reason, my mom and I went to the back room and the emotion was, uh, she was excited for me because she had no, she, first of all, 
her support over the years were, was was amazing because uh, she supported me and, and all of our all of her kids and everything that we did, and so she was very supportive. And to just uh, to see that happen, to go in the first round, um, it was just uh, overwhelming for her. So we we both cried hmm. the whole time. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. What um, what about low point? So, so the the low point you would think I would. I mean, it's around. <laughs> if, if people know my career, uh, being uh, that I um, blew out both my knees uh, on one play in Philadelphia, um, that was a uh, that was a pretty low point. Uh, I think, but thank God I had I had family at that time. I had a wife and I had a daughter. And uh, so, I, you know, I was, uh, I had faith and I, I mean, I thought, I thought that that would, that brought me through it, the injury. Uh, but the lowest point was is when uh, <laughs> the Bears decided to let me go, they cut me. And um, I realized that, uh, you know, I, I hadn't, I hadn't really prepared for life after football. That was the low point. And it was kind of scary at the time. And, you know, the whole, how are you going to transition out of that? I got a family, uh, you know, yeah, I made some money, but, uh, like, it's like Jamar said, you know, that career is so short, you still got the rest of your life to live. Um, so that was the low point for me. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was reading about it when and I was trying to picture it and, um, you know, what I, when I was reading about your injury and it said, basically spent months in a wheelchair with his legs encased in cast from thigh to ankle. I'm trying to visual. I'm like, I can't even <laughs> imagine that. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Uh, I have visually. a picture of it. I have a it's, picture of it. If you'd like to see <laughs> it's, it's, uh, and knowing crazy. the size of Wendell's legs, those were <laughs> really gigantic casts. <laughs> yeah, very, very thin. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what uh, advice would you give when you go back to your your younger self your playing self what advice do you give yourself about um while you're playing for the future and after after the nfl and i'd love you know jamar and brent after you to talk about that what advice do you go back and give yourself or right now someone playing who's like yeah i'm invincible i'm 20 yeah. jamar, like he's like i'm 21 i'm top of my game i'm invincible right now what do you, what advice yeah. do you give your younger and, self? And, and, and I would, I would encourage that. Um, but I would also say that, um, yeah, you're invincible. Cause I think all 20, 21 year olds think they're invincible at that point. But, uh, if I would tell myself, um, don't just define yourself as an athlete. Uh, I would say, um, you know, uh, I don't want to use a cliche. Don't put all eggs in one basket, but you know, don't, you know, make sure you find out who you are and what you want to do. Um, look outside of, of athletics. Um, I, I tell kids when I talk to them, don't be, don't, don't be on a monorail, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a monorail is just a one track that uh, I like to describe. It goes through Disney. It, 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 it's not going to go out of Disney because the, 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 the monorail only goes through Disney. You, you can't, you know, there's no other track. Mm. But you need to get on two tracks, you know, uh, in your education uh, and being an athlete. Uh, and if, it, if you do that, you, you accept you, it, it doesn't guarantee success, but it gives yourself a, give you a better chance at it. Yeah. You know? I mean, playing devil's advocate for a second, is that part of what made you so good, though, that you were so focused on football? And same thing with Brent. You're like, why would anyone do anything besides or yeah. watch or play football? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but... <laughs> I know a lot of other people that are really good who are on two tracks, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, so it's not like, you know, it, it's just, I, I think you can do both. I think it's, it's, they call you a student athlete for a reason. Um, yeah. And uh, you should take advantage of it, uh, you know, and, you know, and, and, and get, believe me, some people, it's, 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 I think it's situation, the situation you're in, right? I mean, some, some people, you know, hey, this is the way that I'm going to make it out of here. And I'm going to focus on totally on this. This is what I know. and This is what I'm going to do. Uh, and, and it works for some people. But, you know, I, I think, like I said, 
doesn't guarantee anything, but I think it gives you mm-hmm. a better chance at being mm-hmm. being successful if you do it the other yeah. opposite way. Jamal, what about you? Advice you would give to your younger self or people out there playing right now? Some some thoughts. Um, I mean, R- Window came with it, man. That was that was a great, great, great response. Um, in terms of you being more than just an athlete. Um, the three things that are always certain is death, taxes, and the end of your professional career. <laughs> so, I was going to say injury and in football. <laughs> so, just the end of your career altogether, you know, at some mm-hmm. point. Um, time will not be time terrific anymore. At some point, he's going to have to hang it up. He might be 50 by the time he does that, but <laughs> but no, seriously, um, there's so many things within your life that you 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 can do and that you were created to do. And from the time that individuals learn that you're fast, or can throw a ball or catch a ball or hit somebody extremely hard, your patterns are made out for you. Your schedule is made out for you, but at some point it's going to end. So, you know, take control of that early. Um, love the game at its purest form, um, mm-hmm. but also at the back of your mind, continue to, to identify with who you are. And so that when you do come where you have to make that transition, it's smoother because you know who you are and what you want to do. Hmm. Brent, what about you, your, your younger self? Yeah. You know what? I think it's easy to say, but you know, enjoy the moment more. Uh, look, and, and to me, it really is the pinnacle of why we have problems transitioning is that, you know, when you're, it's like telling a new parent, Oh, and just enjoy having your kids. And they're like, are you kidding me? I got all this stuff I got to do. And it's like, oh my God, I can't, you know, I can't get any sleep. And, and the same thing with us, you know, I, I think about walking out on a, on a football field, you put it on the pads, you got the, you know, you got the, the uniform on, you're looking good. And, you know, you went out for warm ups. Now you, you're ready to go out there. They're playing the star spangled banner. And, you know, for me, all the intensity, all the work, all the, I mean, just your, You've got that that emotion in you. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, terrified of (laughs) of going out there and and making a fool of myself in front of thousands. Look, we had 65,000 people at the Metrodome. You got millions of people watching on ESPN. You know, for me, at Penn, the most we had was 30,000, maybe, you know. Uh, you know, Jamar was at, at, at Buffalo. So you got Maction, you know, maybe not on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, but on the weekends, you had a few folks, you know, Wendell's <laughs> playing down LSU. That's pro baby. They got everybody down there watching it. But for me, it was, and that's why I used to go to the bathroom so much before the game, because I didn't want to have any accidents on the field. It's like, you don't want to be embarrassed. That's the thing is you're going out there and it's like my manhood is being put on the line right now. I want to curl up in a ball. And I remember, <laughs> I remember the, the, the uh, you know, right before we go out at the Metrodome, there'd be, they had like the carts in the corner. And I'm like, man, I just want to crawl under that cart and hide. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but you know what? I went out there and I faced it. And then by the time you get done with the first hit, you're like, okay, now I'm back into it. Okay, I'm, I can do this. Right. There's nothing that compares to the high of all that work going in and then excelling on the field and feeling like, Hey, I belong. All that work is, is worth it. I faced the demons. I faced all this, you know, the, the challenges you never feel like that again, the pressure and the pressures inside and the butterflies. And because it's not only emotional, but it's physical too. And you're like, there's nothing else. You know, if you go into a business meeting, okay. You go in there and, and that's uh, some sort of a high, but there's no, it's not the physical, you know, the, the pushing yourselves to the, to the limits, breaking fingers, bloody, you know, scraping yourselves on the, on the turf and all that goes into that. There's just so many hours and so much blood, mm. sweat and tears that goes into that. And then the pinnacle of that is then to perform and, and to do that on such a stage and to perform and to be successful and, and to fail, but to then be able to come back. It's just, it's the greatest thing. And we've, we've all done this and we've all pointed to that since we were little kids. That's all we knew in our lives up to that point mm-hmm. was solely into that bucket. And then all of a sudden we're told, yeah, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> and it's like, okay, now what do we do? And, and how do I replace that high? So that's how you get a lot of guys that have issues with, you know, whether it be drugs or whether it be, you know, whatever they're doing 
Um, mm-hmm. You just can't replace that. You try to pick pieces of it, you know, competitive. Uh, I'm going to go play golf. Okay. Nobody's hitting you. You know, it's, and it's a stupid game because I'm not very good at it, but um, you, you, you try to replace bits and pieces. I'm playing baseball again. Cause like Wendell, I wanted to be a catcher. I mean, John, I want to be Johnny bench and I'm catching now and I'm enjoying it, but it's not, it's not, when you talk competition, competition, you talk what we did, you know, to, to, to strap up a helmet and to go out there and to basically get in a fist fight with somebody on national TV. Um, nothing can ever replace that. So I think it's the, yes, you want to enjoy what you can, but you then have to take bits and pieces and you've got to understand, mm. you know, it, it, you're losing something and you've got to grieve for it. And mm. you've got to understand that there's always going to be a hole in me that, that then it's not always bad because it was nerve wracking to go through that. I mean, Wendell, Jamari, he'll, hey, they'll let you know. Hey, I, I got a question I, for, for you guys. Yeah. And, and and I know you do it, so don't don't lie. Okay, I still have dreams that I'm playing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. and I I, I and I, I, it's it's real. Yeah. Yes, they feel so it's real. They, they feel, feel so real that hey, I'm, heart's, I'm still playing. Yeah. yeah, I'm still playing, and oh man, I, I'm, I'm like, oh man, I'm back in the league, <laughs> and I wake <laughs> up and <I'm> like, <laughs> damn, I got to go to work. <laughs> right, but but I think that you know so there is the nerve wracking piece of that. There is that you know coaches can cut you. Yeah, and, I mean, literally, my first year with the Vikings, um, I was Mark Rodenhauser and I were. Mark was a long snapper. A yeah, little, I remember little Rodenhauser. Little, so Rody and I, you know, we, we kind of got this thing in our mind that if they didn't call you by Wednesday to cut you, you got paid for another week. So the rule in, in the house that I shared with them was don't answer the phone till Wednesday. <laughs> it was the stupidest thing in the world because they cut you, they cut you. You know, they just put it on the way right, you're cut. But two of us idiots thought, well, if they can't get a hold of us, they got to pay us another week. So, but it was so, I mean, it was just, yeah, it was stressful, you know, learning new offenses. And then, and again, you know, going out there on the field, somebody's getting paid a lot of money to beat you up. And, <laughs> and then you've got to avoid that. And, and more importantly, avoid the TV cameras. You know, when I got hurt, the one thing I was thinking of, man, that's going to look good on ESPN. But, <laughs> but you get, I mean, I got smacked one time. And my feet were over my head before I knew what was going on. And that, again, that's the first feeling. Getting up, I don't care how hurt I am. They got to show that again. Oh, right. And it's just, so you, you can't That's understand funny. the depth of that, of everything put together and just that high and that excitement and that intensity. And you're never, ever going to replace that again in your life. And I think a lot of guys try to spend the rest of their lives searching for something or things that can get them close to that feeling. And the reality is you've got to grieve just like you would grieve a loved one and just understand that you're never going to feel that way again. You, you've had it once. It was great. But if it, there's a hole in you now that says that's never going to come back. And like Wendell said, if you dream about it, you're like, Oh my God, it's, it's great. And then all of a sudden you wake up, you're like, Oh, but for me then I'm like, Oh, okay. I don't have to go out. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. But that, that's the, I think that's the underrated part about the transition. Is, is that that missing piece there? It just and it, again, it's it's just the intensity, good and bad, because it's both. Mm. A lot of pressure. Yeah, a lot of pressure. Um, I love to hear about a few big influences for each of you, whether it was another player, a coach um, in the league, maybe someone you admired and, and maybe even they you weren't directly in contact with them, but you just they influenced you by the way they played or where they acted. So. Uh, Wendell, I'd love to start with you and, and talk about a few influences for you. Yeah, um, yeah, there were uh, quite a few, um, but uh, people that stand out to me is, uh, you know, Brent, Brent and I were uh, drafted same year by the same team, uh, we same draft class. Uh, but when when we got to the Chicago Bears, they had a nucleus of the um, Super Bowl team still here. Um, and um, guys that uh, really during that time really I I kind of looked up to and, and was watching to see how to be a professional 
uh, football player, uh, guys like uh, Dennis Gentry, um, Mike Singletary, uh, of course, Al Harris, um, uh, Thomas Sanders, uh, guy, guys like that, that I, I was looking at them and saying, oh, man, how do you be a professional football player? Those guys was actually um, – uh, showing me how to do that um, and became good friends and good mentors of mine. And, and then uh, over the years, um, uh, guys that, that played before me, uh, that played around the league that you, you meet and you meet in the Players Association, guys like uh, Emory Moorhead, um, guys like uh, Jim Osborne, uh, who became a big mentor of mine and uh, who hired me and uh, he retired and I hired me for his position when he retired. So, uh, so guys like that are guys that really made an impact on me uh, just because of who they are. Um, nothing about the way they played, um, but it's, it's about uh, who they are. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cause I know you went on and you coached with Mike Singletary, right. Mm-hmm. With the Niners too. So mm-hmm. yeah. Um, Jamal, what about you? Um, influences. <clears throat> yeah. My, uh, my mentor, um, First year in the league was uh, Junior Seah. Um, you know, he's an exceptional individual, um, no longer with us today. Um, for anybody who might not follow football, um, Hall of Famer. Um, but Junior Seah, I grew up 11 years old rocking the Junior Seah jersey. <laughs> so to share the field with him was huge. But I'll never forget, um, you know, the first time we, we really linked up. Um, I used to watch Junior. Junior never opened his playbook. <laughs> Junior had many, 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 many years of experience in the, in the NFL and never opened his playbook. And so I remember walking up to him and asking him, like, dude, how did you, you always know where to go. You know every play even before it happens and you never open your playbook. So he said, come in and watch film with me. So every Wednesday and Thursday, I would get up at 6 a.m. and we watch film together. And um, he played linebacker, I played corner. And you know, the two totally different positions, both on defense, but they're different. But he was able to teach me things that he learned as a linebacker that helped me um, on the field as, as a defensive back. So, you know, one, I'll give you a quick example. You know, he told me that whenever offensive linemen watch their feet, whenever they pass block, look at it in the first quarter. And by the time the third and fourth quarter comes, you'll notice that set starts to extend a little bit more. And that's because they're getting tired and they still mm-hmm. That lets you know when you're in cover two that you're going to set the edge. So it gives you a second, you know, uh, of, of a head start to go ahead and prepare yourself for setting the edge. Right. Mm-hmm. Protection. So it was little things like that um, on the field, but off the field, the way he carried himself. Um, strong Christian, nice to everyone, always positive, always upbeat, um, just the most kindest, gentle spirit that you'll ever meet. And so, um, you know, that was just a, 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 a individual that, you know, definitely influenced me and, and carried itself the right way and humble regardless of his status. So. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. It's T left too early. So, um, Brent, what about you? Well, I'm going to say you guys didn't, so I'm going to cover it. Obviously mom and dad, cause mm. yeah, and I'm good. yeah, you guys forgot it, but I'm going to say that. But, uh, no, for me, for their defense, one, I one did one ask, I did guess players. So. Players, okay. So Wendell, Wendell's got a, Player, Wendell's yeah. got a short, uh, short memory. Wendell, we came out the same year. Wendell was drafted first round, so he got 82. I was a free agent. So they gave me number 98 <laughs> as a tight end. I, and, I, you know, somebody says, well, why'd you wear 98? I said, because I couldn't wear a three-digit number. So, <laughs> uh, but as far as uh, players, you know, for on the Bears, it was definitely Emory. I mean, Emory Moorhead. Emory. So, <laughs> I love Emery. Emery is the greatest. Emery's last year was my first year. So, yeah. um, and Emery breaking his leg in the third game of the season is the reason I got called back. So my whole career is due to Emery's bad news. <laughs> so thank God for Emery more. Emery <laughs> taught me to cut block too, because Emery was not a big guy. So he, that cut block was, that was a saving grace. I use that yeah. a lot. Ask, uh, uh, <laughs> from, uh, from the Packers, uh, Tim, uh, I forget Tim's right. like, uh, like, Harris. Tim Harris. Harris. Yeah. I cut Tim 20 times in a game. The Herschel Walker's <laughs> first game, I cut him 20 times, and Herschel Walker got 275 yards. So <laughs> thank you, Emery, uh, for the career. And then, obviously, six years I spent backing up Steve Jordan uh, with the Vikings. Steve went to Brown, Ivy League, mm. smartest guy, great athlete, phenomenal athlete. The fact that that guy's not in the Hall of Fame, 
is a joke and it's because he lived up in, you know, he played in Minnesota, but Steve to me, just, it was mind and body because we played with a guy by the name of Joey Browner and Joey was the toughest SOB yeah. man. That was a safety, strongest hands. And you used to go up against him and Joey was like 220, you know, about six, two, about my size. I was six. I didn't like, I didn't like that guy. Didn't like Joey. No, I didn't know. You try to block him in practice and you, he do like, he was like a black belt. So yeah. you'd be on the ground and you're like, what happened? I have no idea what he just did. So we go out to team practice and you try to block Joey. He'd make you look like a fool. He'd get in on the tackle. And I was back there one day and I'm like, Steve, how do you block Joey? And Steve goes, oh, man. And Steve was so laid back. That's the greatest thing about Steve, too. He said, oh, man, all you got to do with Joey, don't touch him. I go, what? He goes, Joey doesn't like to be touched. Don't touch him. I said, well, how am I going to block if I don't touch him? He goes, you'll figure it out. So <laughs> next play, I run up to Joey. I go, Joey, I got you. Didn't touch him, just walked up to him face to face. Joey, I got you. Hands down on my side. He stayed right there with me. Six more years. Every <laughs> play, I got Joey. Joey, I got you. Okay. If you didn't touch him, you didn't piss him off, and he wouldn't ruin the play. So, I mean, you know, but that, those guys were phenomenal. And, and the fact, yeah, Steve Jordan made the ring of honor. He should be yeah. in Canton. He's one of the best tight ends ever played the position, and he had longevity. I would love for you. First of all, thank all of you. I love listening to amazing stories, amazing advice. Um, I want to just you know, tell people a little bit what you're working on now, where they could find you. And, and by the way, Brent, yeah, like I grew up around the corner from the Moorheads and actually my brother was good friends with Aaron growing up. Aaron, so yeah. I was able to go uh, to the Colts games at, at times too. So yeah, great family. Um, so what you're working on now, where should people should, should learn more? Uh, Wendell, what, tell people a little bit what you're working on now and where they can check you out. Well, uh, right now I am currently a uh, manager of diversity for a, uh, a local uh, steel processing company in the Elk Grove Village. I've uh, been in this position for almost four years now, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, my uh, mentor, Jim Osborne, was in this position for over 20 years. And uh, he decided to retire. And so he recruited me to take his position. And so I, I stepped in his shoes. Uh, uh, he retired this year, so I stepped in his shoes this year. But uh, that's what I'm doing. We are one of the largest um, uh, steel, steel processing uh, companies in North America, minority owned. Uh, we've been around for over 55 years. Wow. Amazing. Jamal, what about you? I'm a client engagement executive for RL Canning. Um, we're homegrown here um, in Chicago, minority owned, woman owned entity. Uh, we're now global. Um, you know, we, we provide tons of services for an IT space for Chicago public schools, state of Illinois, um, health and hospitals, along with some, some major Fortune 100 companies as well. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a board of director member for an organization called Ryan Banks Academy. So it's the um, only um, boarding school here in Chicago um, with the emphasis on the social emotional aspects of learning that is tuition free for students. Hmm. Amazing. Thanks, Jamar. Awesome. Brent, what about you? Texas. Well, since I retired 27 years now, going on 27, uh, insurance investments, uh, work with a lot of small businesses, small mid sized businesses, individuals doing their plan, getting them all set for whatever retirement, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that the three of us share is we're all on the board of the local NFL Players Association chapter, the former players. Wendell's actually the president. I'm the treasurer. Jamal's uh, a key vice president. And uh, you can go to rpfpc.com, rpfpc, which is Retired <laughs> Professional Football Players of Chicago. Dot com. And I, I came up with that name thinking somebody more, much more creative would replace that at some point, and we don't have anybody more creative than me. It's scary. Yeah, it, goes but, to show uh, you, it goes to show you how creative you are. Yeah. <laughs> scary, scary. So uh, that's, our, that's actually the foundation. That's our foundation, our 501c3 charitable arm. We uh, raise money for scholarships. We give uh, local boy and girl, high school seniors. Um, the NFLPA gives them $2,500 scholarships um we give another 500 and then we give three thousand dollars to them for the rest of their 
uh, college career, the next three years. And then we also give youth football organizations in Chicago, <clears throat> deserving youth football organizations that um, are you know, undergoing rough times uh, money-wise. We give them football grants, equipment grants. So, and then just tie our guys together and, and really link the brotherhood of, of former players so that we can support other charitable organizations because we get a million different requests and we like to fill them and guys love to to be here and be in the area and, and help out so even when they're in detroit which is a wonderful thing it's great outreach thank you hey, all jeremy, one, one, yeah, go ahead jeremy go ahead, one thing i'd like to add yeah. uh, just to 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 kind of transition or to to uh piggyback on what's what we've been talking about uh, today uh, as, as far as transitioning um the the nflpa um and when Brent and I, the, the NFLP wasn't as strong as it is now when Brent and I was, was in the league, uh, but I'm, I'm sure you, um, um, Jamar can attest to this. Um, they, but over the years, um, they developed so many resources now uh, for players uh, to, to help them with the transition. So, I mean, you got anything from uh, educational, um, their health, uh, family matters. I mean, anything you can think of that that players will have a struggle with transitioning from the NFL. Uh, the the PA has created these great resources like the trust and things like that uh, to help players transition. So uh, it's it's getting a whole lot better, and I think it's going to keep improving. Thank you all. Um, mention Brent one more time the URL. So it's rpfpc.com. Got it. Got it. <laughs> dot com. Yes, Got yeah. it. First of all, thank you all. And the first one to thank you. Thanks everyone. Check out more episodes and we'll see you on the other side. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.